Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie. And on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a virtual event this evening with Justine Bateman and conversation with Nancy Etcoff discussing Face, One Square Foot of Skin. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at BookSoup. Our next event is Thursday, April 8th, so in two days, um, with, uh, with Caroline Kapnis in conversation with Mary Kubica discussing You Love Me. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter, which you can do on our website. To submit a question during the event, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like our speakers to answer, please click the Like button. We will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. And also, Justine and Nancy will not be reading the sidebar tonight. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click the green purchase button that reads Face directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're selling digital audiobooks and eBooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. A little more about Justine. Filmmaker and author Justine Bateman has an impressive decades long resume in film and TV that includes a Golden Globe nomination and two Emmy nominations. Bateman wrote and produced directorial film short, uh, film short debut, Five Minutes, which premiered at the 2017 Toronto Film Festival and was chosen by seven more festivals, including the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival. It was one of the winners of the 2019 Amazon Prime Video Direct Festival Stars program and was chosen by both Short of the Week and Vimeo staff pick. Violet, Bateman's directorial feature film debut of her own script, stars Olivia Munn, Luke Bracey, and Justin Thoreau. It premiered at 2021's uh, South by Southwest Film Festival. Her best-selling first book, Fame, a nonfiction book about society's need for its presence, was published in 2018 by Akashic Books. Her second book, Faith, was <laughs> released in, two, in April 2021, right now, by Akashic. Justin holds a UCLA, Justine holds a UCLA degree in computer science and digital media management. A little more about Nancy. Nancy Atkoff is a professor at Harvard Medical School Department of Psychiatry, a faculty member of the Harvard University Mind Brain Behavior Initiative, and the director of the program in aesthetics and well-being at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Atkoff conducts scientific investigations in the psychology and biology of beauty and aesthetics and, and in the neuroscience of emotion. Her research has culminated in numerous awards and her book, Survival of the Prettiest, The Science of Beauty, has been published in over a dozen languages and was the subject of a one-hour Discovery Channel documentary. Her 2004 TED Talk on happiness and its surprises has been viewed by over 2 million people, um, and TED curator Chris Anderson listed this 2004 talk as one of the five talks he learned the most from. It's a lot from both of them. <laughs> yeah, yes. All right. So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Justine and Nancy. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, before we start, I just want to say thank you so much, Book Soup. If you, I don't know, if, and, and welcome everybody who's in the audience. Yes. I'm so happy you're here. If you live in Los Angeles or if you're ever in LA, go to Book Soup. It's a really cool bookstore where all the bookshelves are like towering above you when it's sort of tight fit through the um through the the bookshelves and it's a it's great it's a great bookstore feeling in there and the staff picks really great books if you ask for recommendations and anyway we're really glad you're all here and i'm so glad nancy could do this if you should i wish in amazon they'd put like by face with survival of the prettiest <laughs> and the other because you know if you guys are in well, we like, check out nancy's book it's really interesting survival of the prettiest well, I'm really delighted to be here in conversation. We've already had a couple of really interesting conversations, and I'd love to just keep that going and dig into some of the topics that we've started uh, before. So tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book, how this came about, 
And I love the format that you have, which is individual stories, mm. all coming at things from a similar perspective, but yet different life experiences. Yeah, I, um, I, some of people listening may have heard me say this, but in my first book, Fame, there was a chapter where I had, I had Googled my name and the autocomplete said, Justine Bateman looks old. And that really, um, that really affected me uh, I mean, hopefully it won't sound arrogant, but I had just never been criticized for my face before. So there was that. And also I was like 41, 42. I didn't think I looked that old at all, but for reasons I go into in the book in fame, um, there were fears of mine that became the anchors that allowed that idea to become a belief in me. And it really anchored in and it really messed with my head for like a while. So I had to work all that out of myself. And then once I did, I started thinking about what fears are in place in, in society as a whole around us that serve as anchors for that idea amongst us, not just in us individually. Um, and so, yeah, and I thought, well, this is really messed up that in society we have this idea that women's faces should be fixed. I thought this, this matter of fact um, receptivity to the idea that women's faces, that you should go get Botox, you should go get plastic surgery, you should go get fillers, without their, I, I found that to be too much of a, a like a fact that yes. society had inhaled yes. and, and assimilated. And I was like, wait, 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 wait can't we, we just leapfrog the conversation about it. We leapfrog the discussion about it. And I just, I felt that it was so, uh, so damaging to women that this is placed on them as some sort of fact in our society. It, when it's not a fact, it's just an idea that was brought in and made a belief. And we can fully reject it. We can fully say, mm, I don't think so. I don't like it. Uh, I don't like that idea. I don't like your hypothesis and I'm not going to go along with it. And so I wanted to look at what are some of the reasons that our society would, what are some of the fears in our society that would call, that would create those anchors to, to, to make it a belief. And I, I feel that by doing that, cause that's kind of what I do for myself individually, that by exposing those anchors or those fears, most of the time for me, they're irrational. Once I expose them, they'll start to decay. So I, I'm hoping to do that for others, um, that they'll go, yeah, maybe I am thinking that because I'm concerned about um, being provided for. Because truly, my fears have nothing to do with this skin here. They're, they reside in me, so I better work on getting rid of those. Because if I change my face, I'm still going to have those fears. And exactly. I'm still going to carry them around with me. So. That's the, that's the reason I wrote it, yeah. Yes, and so many women carry those fears and they don't wanna talk about them. And, they, and more and more I'm reading articles of women in their 20s and their 30s already going for what they call prejuvenation, you know, where, <laughs> prejuvenation, where, uh -huh. where they just keep up so that they always have this 25 or 30 year old face of, and go in for little procedures. And no one stops to say, well, what's wrong with looking a little older? What's wrong with looking your age? What's wrong with the power that comes with age and experience and knowledge uh, and being a mentor and helping others and putting together fantastic projects? Why do we shrink away from that and think, no, we just have to be a pretty face? Now, you know, in my book, I took an evolutionary point of view. When we can see certainly in, in far history that uh, men and women who wanted to have uh, babies would have to be of the age of procreation. Yeah. But we've come a long way since then. And somehow even the most accomplished women such as yourself can yeah. walk away and say, what's wrong with my face? I need to talk about this. Is this a source of insecurity? when you have a beautiful face um, and yet it's very hard for women. And so I think you're bringing up a key cultural issue that few people have tackled. Yeah, I mean, even just that, you know, the, 
evolution. Um, I, I think I, I happen, you know, I don't have anywhere near the 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 knowledge and learning that you have in that arena. And I'm not an anthropologist, but from what I do understand about anthropology, I mean, it's a lot to do with resources and, yes. you know, fear that you would not um, participate in the resources of the, of, you know, like at a tribal level of the tribe. Exactly. And so if that, if that strikes a chord in somebody, when they read like that aspect that I have introduced in the, in, you know, in, in these stories in the book, if that strikes a chord with someone, hopefully they can say, okay, yeah, I feel that feels real to me. Like I do, I am concerned I'm not going to be provided for, right? Yes. And then they can, you know, let allow the irrational fear to come up, acknowledge it, and yeah. then allow the rational mind to say, well, Susie, you know, you can drive down to the supermarket anytime you want and get any provision you want, any resources you want. And then your rational mind can say to your irrational fear, yeah, so you can go now. Like, thanks for trying to protect me to make sure I would get provisions and, and rations. Exactly. It's actually, you know, vestigial because I, I have this opportunity of going to grocery stores because we're in 2021. And, and that's the only way I know how to get rid of those irrational fears because my system doesn't know the difference between a, a rational fear and, and an irrational fear. And the example of that is when you, if you have a dream that your whole family was killed and you wake up in a panic and you're panting and you're crying, sobbing, right? Mm -hmm. And then you wake up and you're like, oh no, that was a dream. And you have to tell your mind, you have to repeat your mind over and over again. It wasn't real, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Because your whole system thinks it happened. And that's the same way I feel our, we react to irrational fears that we carry around with us. Yes, and those irrational fears are often located in very primal centers of the brain. Okay. That we don't make contact with the more rational brain, cognition, emotion. And so that's part of the problem. People get panicky about things. It, they, it triggers the fear. The fear must be about something real. And, but it's not coming from our higher cognitive sources. It's just coming from some quick automatic reaction. Maybe someone won't like me or reject me or yeah. says I don't look right. Or, and it immediately goes limbic system, not verbal, and lodges there until someone helps people to figure out why they're feeling this way. Uh, because it isn't rational, but it, it's right there in the brain. So it's it's really hard to get around and not many people talk about it. Now I would imagine in your business, people talk about the face even more uh, and worry about it. I mean, do you find with actors and actresses that they are obsessed with their face? Are they comfortable with who they are? How does that play out for people who are always in front of the screen? I think part of it is, um, to be so, I haven't acted for many, many years. But I, when I, when I was acting, it's very you have a very acute sense that uh, you are in a non-proactive role in the business. Hmm. You are not putting together projects. You are not picking when you're going to work. You are on the you know on the line in the playground at recess, getting picked for dodgeball. You're not the dodgeball captains. You're getting yes. picked. So because of that, because that's a hard kind of position to swallow, because you're, you're talking about your your vocation, your um, your creative um, your creative satisfaction, your financial security. All to imagine that all of that is not in your control at all. Yep. Um, is very uncomfortable. And I think some of the ways that we deal with the discomfort of, of, of there, there being no mistake about uh, being in a situation you can't control is we'll turn on ourselves. I mean, this is the, yeah. this is how anorexics operate. I can't control anything around me. And so I will, I can control my body though. And so if I lose enough weight, that will trigger a, uh, something changing on the outside when then anorexics wind up, you know, eating their own, their body eats their own organs and then, then you're dead. You. So in that same way, actors 
will often change representations going, well, mm. you no, know, maybe it's, if they make it about themselves and they make it like, I'm not getting these roles because of something I'm doing that can give someone a comfort. We do it in relationships too. Like a relationship we think is dead, but we're like, oh, it's because the guy is selfish or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but if we want it to continue, it's better if we then assume that uh, the problem lies with us because we have control over us. Oh, it's because exactly. I'm too fat, too too short, too tall, have the wrong color hair. I'll change these things and then the relationship yep. will change or my career will change. Or it's probably because I have the wrong agents. I'll get different agents. Yes. When in fact, that's those most of the time are not the reasons. Yes. You as an actor are an ingredient for a larger recipe. And if you're not exactly the right ingredient for that particular recipe, you're not going to be brought in on that project. But it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So thinking all of that, of course, it goes to one of the options as you get older is beyond uh, maybe I'm too fat, too tall. My hair's the wrong yeah. color is maybe there's something wrong with my face. Yes. If I change my face, that'll change. I will affect a change in how often I'm hired when yep. in fact, that was perhaps never the problem. So yes. now you're going to have two problems. You will <laughs> change your face and you still don't have any control over your, you know, your, your opportunities to be employed. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people think only about age factors and they don't think about, well, I would imagine as an actor, you have to express so much emotion. Yeah. You have to look that that emotion is real. And if part of your face is frozen or, or changed, it's going to be hard to do that. And, yeah. you know, so I often wonder, I sometimes see certain actresses and I, it's obvious that they've had, you know, fillers or Botox or whatever, and they're not emoting in the way that a regular face would emote. And yeah. so it's it's a sacrifice. what? Yeah, it, it's, you are sacrificing. I, I was watching a project uh, recently and it wasn't really clear in some of these scenes um, what sort of position the audience was to take on what was happening to the character. Yep. So naturally, you look to the actor who's playing that character to get a clue, right? If they seem happy, then you're like, oh, this is a good thing for them. If they seem sad, you're like, oh, no, this, they don't, this isn't good. But there was very li little I could get from this particular actress's face. And, and therefore, it just became a sort of an arduous uh, 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 situation sure. for me because I, I was like trying to figure out what's going on here. But the... It's not just with, with the trouble with it happening to, with actresses and actresses succumbing to that. I wouldn't even say it's a pressure. I'd say it's a fear. Yes. Um, yeah. Even though things are said to actresses. So I don't want to make it sound like, like they don't get conversations yeah. directed at them. And, all, you know, online criticism, that's no fun. Um, but when you see uh, people who uh, one would one the people have looked up to as being some of the more attractive people according to this society um yep. in our society um and they see the criticism that's leveled at them and maybe maybe the person who's watching this is plainer looking yep that i you know builds a panic in them that like well if they're criticizing them how much more are they going to criticize me yes. and particularly the younger women i think this is a mm -hmm. um an element to or one of the reasons that younger women are doing it is they see the abuse that is leveled at all the older women. And maybe they look at these older women and don't have a problem with their faces. Maybe they're okay. like, I don't know, I think they look fine, but oh my God, I don't want to be attacked like that. So I better just do all this now so yes. that I don't get that when I'm older. Yes. And I think it's it's such a distraction to the things that these women could be doing in their lives. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And they have people have to think, well, what what's really important to me? What do I want to accomplish in this life? Yeah. Um, what do I want to be known for? What haven't I done that I really still want to do? And how much am I going to let other factors take away some of my power? or yeah. make me feel like I can't do this, or I'm too old, or I don't look right, or whatever. And so I think often with people, when I see people privately in therapy, I'd like to find 
what would you most want to do with your life? How did you start out? Is this what you still want to do? What are your goals? What will get you there? And it's not going to be getting more and more plastic surgery. It's going to be self-acceptance, understanding your own strengths, having confidence in who you are, and going after them. But people get lost on this road so easily. I mean, as an academic, it's not as big a factor as I'm sure it is in filmmaking, but it's still there. And women are very conscious of their appearance and they spend a lot of time worrying about it. And I often just want to shape people and say, you have so much to offer. You have so much to offer. And let's start talking about that. And if people are happier and they're doing what they like, they have that look of health, of mm -hmm. happiness, of purpose. And those things are, are really what's important, you know, throughout life. And especially as we get older and have dreams of what we want to, to do and help other people do. So I think it's, it's such a distraction for us, but it's become so normative. You know, yeah, that's people what think, I don't like about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people want to get it. That's fine with me, but it yeah. shouldn't be normative. It shouldn't be something that gets in the way or is time consuming or just antithetical to how the person wants to live. Let me ask you, like with these clients that you've seen who um, feel that if they get plastic surgery, it will like they maybe they express what their goal is in life. And they say, well, if I get this plastic surgery, I'll get closer to that. And then they go and do it. I'm assuming you've had somebody like this. And yeah, yeah. They haven't. So they get the plastic surgery and then realize that it didn't get them closer to what they wanted. Yeah. How how is that? How has that sat with your clients? Like, what kind of realization is that for them? Yeah, well, I think it's very enlightening for them because they, they assume that there's a power in this. Mm. It's going to translate to others and to themselves looking in the mirror. And it doesn't always. Matter of fact, a lot of people are disappointed by the results. Um, they go in, they say, well, you know, I spent all this money and mm. I don't see. And so, so if actually a, a plastic surgeon is more um, subtle, Often people don't like this because they can't see anything. But then uh, it looks like, oh, oh no. Yeah, I know. I know. I look the same. What, you, what did you do? I just put all this money. Um, you know, and then other people, you know, they'll say, okay, I want more, more, more. And then they look ridiculous, you know. Mm -hmm. So it is something that most people can have minor procedures, I suppose. I haven't had anything. So just full confession, I don't do anything to my face. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's been fine for me. But but for some people, it isn't. Um, and even in, you know, growing up, my family was very looks conscious. I mean, very. Oh, really? So wait, how'd you turn out like this then? Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just was never as interested. Um, you know, came from a family that my father was in the jewelry business. You know, everyone just always looked fabulous. And so I enjoyed that, but I knew that was not going to be who I was. You know, that it wasn't going to be my preoccupation. I really was interested in literature and psychology. I was going to go on in school and that's what got my engines rolling. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting though. But growing up, I was very aware. And I think it's one of the things that propelled me to write my book. I really want to understand yeah. what might be behind this preoccupation with being the prettiest. Uh, what, what does it in the end net for any of us? And it started me on that road. Yeah, I love that book. Um, yeah, it was quite I, fun to write. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do feel like I don't feel like I, against women who are doing anything. You yeah, know, I, I yeah. don't want to do anything. But, you know, I think that's like, why would I do, you know, I don't want to criticize other women. But I, what I find to be um, a real shame and a real missed opportunity is when those women feel insecure or they yes. they they want to get somewhere in their lives or they want to find a mate or whatever. That, and they're, they're convinced that if they do this, that'll get them there. I just, I hope that anybody who wants to do plastic surgery or has already done plastic surgery yeah, yeah. to go like, okay, what, what was the completion of that sentence when you said like, I need to get plastic surgery or else X will happen. Yes. It won't happen. Like, what is that thing? Is it that you won't get a mate or that you won't continue working or nobody's going to want to be around you or whatever that thing is? I believe that's a fear that resides in you still if you haven't dealt with it. Yes. So 
If yes. you're trying to do the plastic surgery, fine, but take that fear, whatever, where, whatever you've completed that sentence with, take that separately. Yes. And deal with yes. that. Write that, write it, uh, or, you know, this is just what works for me. So it yes, no, it's a very good technique because you get at the heart of what the issue is. What's driving you to do this? Exactly. And right. You might put water anyway, but, but what's driving you and what's the larger issue, the fear? And once you can get beyond that, yeah, yeah. So why not take that opportunity yeah. to remove one of your buttons? Because yes. then that way, you know, then you'll, and then once you're button free with that issue, and then you still want to go get plastic surgery, like go get it. But, yeah. but otherwise, it'll just be like you'll have a mound of fears and you'll put a carpet over it. And then those fears will start po poking up through the carpet or in the rug, the carpet, and then you'll put another one over it, and then fears right. will start, and another one, another one, and before you know, you just have this pile of carpet, pile of carpets over this enormous mound of fears. Why not get rid of the fears? And if you still want to put a carpet down on the ground, it's not going to be lumpy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I remember working with one woman who had to give public talks, and she had been more private and she was asked to give a bunch of talks and she would always say oh i'm so worried about my thighs that her big thing was her thighs and you know and i said to her i wonder if it's really the thighs that are worrying you something you are projecting your concerns onto them when in fact no one's looking at them behind the podium and why are you so you know almost despising part of your own body yeah. And I worked with her and I think it was very effective because she always would say, well, I have, this isn't right. And the reason I'm nervous is because, you know, someone will see this flaw in me or that rather than focusing on, you know, uh, more important things for her. But talking about her, it became very interesting because talking about her thighs actually led to a lot of breakthroughs. That's great. Yeah. I mean, one way for me to get to like, what's that irrational fear is to say, okay, whatever you think your problem is. Yep. Like, like, let's say like, oh, look how this, look how this, look how this skin is loose here. And if I go, okay, well, let's, all right. So you're afraid that that's going to keep you from who knows what, I don't know what. Now let's say you go get like a lower facelift. Yeah. So let's say that's gone. Like it's, yeah. Well, a plastic surgeon would do it better than I just did my fingers. But anyway, let's, job. <laughs> let's say it's not there. Okay. And then I go, oh, okay. So now what? And I go, oh, well, now I now I feel fine. Now I feel like I'll be able to get those things. It's like, will you? Yeah. Are are you guaranteed now you'll get it? It's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe my presentation isn't right. Maybe it's not. Yes. Yes. Because nobody, when I'm going in to like do a presentation or something, I don't think they're going. Well, I don't. I wanted to hire her for the job, but then I saw <laughs> that she had this thing. Here. And I don't think she'll be able to do the job that well. I, I, I think that's never happened to me. Yeah, I know it's never happened to me either. As, a, as like a filmmaker, a writer and all this. I mean, of course, as an actress, if you're going in and, and you're saying, and you're going in, if I were still acting, I was going in for the part of a 30-year-old, a you know, maybe they'd go, I don't know. I think the audience might go, I'm not sure if she's 30 because look at how her neck is and stuff. Yeah. We don't want the audience like, Jumping back from the emotional <laughs> age and wondering about her age and yep. you know, for those purposes, like that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, uh, it does absolutely. Yeah. So what, what? So you talked a lot about women being angry. Yeah. And let's talk about so a few of the characters in the book and what makes them angry. One of my favorite anger, and and it's not just that that I. You know, I say like, you know, women, um, uh, women's faces getting older and why that makes people angry is like what I've been saying about this because it's kind of yeah. provocative, right? Yes. Yeah. And what I found mostly is that the people criticizing the faces are really angry. And I'm just like, wow, why? Who, yeah. cares? Who cares what my face is like? Yeah. You know, I mean, how does that interfere with, with their lives, right? But they like their, their reactions were so vociferous. Yes. And, and then the shame that the women feel was so acute, too. Yes. I mean, yes. that I experienced, too. So one of my favorite um, uh, stories, I won't read it here because we don't have that much time, but 
um, for those of you that get the book, um, number 15, Billy, I'll just read like the first paragraph, yeah? So this is on page, if anyone already has the book, it's on page 101. So Billy, 49, real estate agent. Billy resented Karen. Of course she did. Karen, porcelain smooth skin, plump lips spreading over stark white teeth, handing out cupcakes in exchange for middle school, middle school kids' grimy dollar bills, smiling, flashing teeth, tossing brass hair, right bosom threatening to splash from the low neck of her cashmere sweater, leaning over the bake sales table and standing up, leaning over and standing up. Billy imagined the children would welcome Karen's full naked breasts as a righteous reminder of all that was life sustaining and necessary. The faculty and nearby parents would greet these bare gravity defying lilac scented mounds as a sign from God that all is right in the world and that goodness prevails, the rainbow after the rain. That's what Billy imagined would happen if Karen's goddamn fake pit <laughs> fell out of her slutty neck sweater right now. Yeah. <laughs> Billy's problem with Karen, it goes over later, yeah. is that Billy had felt wronged, cheated. She felt cheated. Billy had been beautiful, was still beautiful to some, but Karen did not grow up beautiful, was not beautiful as a child, as a teen, nor as a young adult. Billy knew this. Karen had been average, a seven, Billy knew. Billy, on the other hand, had been a 10, considered a 10 for years. As Billy aged, though, she felt like her ranking fell. Nine, eight, seven, six. And all things being equal, Karen's seven of years past should have been a three by now. Like, this is count. A fucking three. But Karen cheated. That's what pissed Billy off. Karen fucking cheated. Breast implants, face lift, teeth tightening, hair bleaching. Karen fucking hit the nitro button on the car and passed Billy. Fucking cheated. Karen looks amazing for her, her age and all that bullshit. Fucking fake ass three posing as a seven. Uh, yeah. Stop it. Love that's, it. Some, that's like, you know, some of the anger that can come. But um, yeah, I just, the thing that struck me most was this, the, the anger that it elicits in, in people who are criticizing other women's, uh, criticizing other women's faces or if they're men, yes. women's faces. And, um, but it's like it's like there's nowhere to go. There's when people do it, they get upset. When people oh, yeah. don't do it, they criticize them. It's like where is there to go here? But in the same way that we were just talking about, if you if you're criticizing your thighs or your face or something, yep. it's probably because it's about something else. Absolutely. But in that yeah. same way, when these people are criti you know, it's to focus on myself in this aspect. If somebody, well, all these people that were criticizing me and so angry about my face and so passionate about it, I'm like, really? Really? So I think, okay, why are they, in the same way your client found, you know, something wrong with her thighs, why are they finding something wrong with my, what's going on in their life? Exactly. That this has become a focus, that yeah. my face, I don't know them. I'm not in their, you know, in their lives or anything. Why would it matter? So there must be something going on for them. Yeah. yeah. Right? Exactly. Either that's either they're scared about their own faces getting older and they think, you know, in the same way somebody, you know, when you hear about, uh, say, a man who, who feels he's a homosexual, but he's very concerned about how that would look to others mm -hmm. and say there's a, a, another homosexual man who, who moves into the neighborhood and everybody's getting to know him and he's very against him and criticizes him and stuff, probably because he wants everybody to know that he doesn't want to have anything, that yes. he's not that way. So yes. maybe these criticisms are people being terrified of their own faces changing for their own reasons. They see my face changing. Yes. I, you know, they've seen me since I was 16. It's like, yeah, I'm different than 16. Thank God. I don't want to look like I'm 16. I, look <laughs> like I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So anyway, that's something for other people. I feel like to examine, like if I was hypercritical of some filmmaker or author or whatever, I feel like I would have to go like, okay, I've got a resentment against this person. But why? Like, I don't even know them. Exactly. What's going on in me? Like that's how I would get rid of it. Cause I yeah. want to be able to carry on and not not have these bags of resentment that I'm walking around with, right? It just weighs people down. It weighs us down. 
And there are examples of, and you mentioned some of them in, in your book or uh, when you're interviewed, I mean, that are just beautiful older. I mean, there's lots of people who retain, maybe even become more beautiful as they age. Their face becomes interesting. It becomes lined in certain ways. It has character. It has gravity. I don't know. There's ways in which older faces can look beautiful. And but yeah. for some people, just seeing the lines in the age make them run away. It makes them run away, which says something about them, not the person. Exactly. exactly. And maybe some of that is, I mean, there is a long history in, in our, in human society of feeling frightened or intimidated by women and yep. by the, um, the acute instincts that women have. Yeah. Um, the, and then as she get, you know, I mean, for many, many years, it kept women from getting an education because that was threatened. Education, the so, vote, I mean, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Putting just, on property. Just, just so people know, like, I am, I, I love guys. I am not one of those, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not one of those, like, you know, uh, female power and tear down the patriarchy. I'm not, I'm like, yeah. Exactly. I, I love what the patriarchy has built. Like, let me use a lot. Me use a lot. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, guys. We'll, we'll I'm not about like that. But I think there's something really special about women yeah. and about their yeah. wisdom and their instincts and their, um, and then as they gain more and more information through, um, you know, enrich their intelligence through ac academia, learning and all of this, all of that just becomes more and more acute. Yes. And I think that is terrifying yeah. to some people. It is. Um, maybe it's frightening to the women themselves even. Because I that's what the older faces yep. in women signal to me. Like she knows things. Yes. And I and you know, in the same way, like if somebody is a I don't know, a soothsayer or a psychic or I don't know, people are like, oh, really? Like maybe they don't want to be around them because they don't want to, they don't want to be seen, right? Yes. So maybe yes. a woman's older face makes other people feel like they're going to be seen and it makes them mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And so they want to push that away. So maybe they'll try and make the woman feel uncomfortable instead. Yep. All to say, whoever's got an older face and doesn't want to feel shame about it, I would just invite them to um, entertain the idea that when somebody's criticizing you, it might be for all those kinds of reasons. Well, that's it. There's nothing wrong with your face. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Part of it might be pro projection of their own uh, issues, and um, you know, there's always going to be people out there who want to put other people down from their own insecurities from all their inability to kind of look at their own life and say, you know, have I gotten where I want to go? But I think we just have to let these people just ride on by. But it's very yeah. hard until we've had therapy or really thought deeply about this to let it go. Because from the yeah. compulsive, you, you hear kids being teased for yeah. their age or for the, their look or, or anything. And people are, can be very nasty. Um, even in youth. And so it's getting better now with different generations, but a lot of people are subject to teasing uh, about all kinds of aspects of their um, body, their face. Yeah. And it becomes, you know, kind of defensive posture that a lot of people will put up. For sure. So for me, anytime somebody said something to me that, like I said, pushes my buttons, mm -hmm. I want to be able to go like, oh, just pass on by. But I have to... I can't do that through positive affirmations. I have to actually address yep. what, how that affected me. Yes. Like, yes. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to, I've said before, like, I don't want to change other people. They can oh, keep okay. being like that. I don't care. Go yeah, ahead. Exactly. Keep, keep criticizing me. I don't give a shit. <laughs> the only way I can get to the point where I don't give a shit is if I deal with, I can't just posture that I don't give a shit. I have to actually, for me, Get rid of those fears. Oh, well, they yes. said that, and that made me afraid that then X, Y, Z would be true. Yep. yep. Or if that's true, what they just said, then I'm afraid I I won't work anymore, whatever it is, right? Yes, I mean, exactly. Yeah. 
And so the fears get very exaggerated to very important aspects of life. Yeah. So the more you try to put them down, the bigger they get. I won't get this. I won't find the mate. I won't get the job I want. I won't, you know, and it just balloons. And so what has to be addressed is that core fear and yeah. what exactly it means and to wrestle with that and dispel it. Uh, but until oh, people do. I, and actually, you know, as we get older, we should be able to dispel a lot more than we could when we were younger. Yes, absolutely. Because I feel like it's not enough to just tell myself, okay, let it go by. And it's not even enough for me to just, you know, write out this fear, like understand what this fear is. I have okay. to then say, okay, okay, I've, I've exposed that my concern is, just for an example, that I'm never going to work again. Let's yep. say somebody's fear. Now, now what do I do? I've exposed it, okay, and I know it'll start to erode because I become aware of it. But then I also have to, I have to couple that with some sort of faith, some yes. sort of belief. Yes. I mean, for someone, it's God. For someone else, maybe it's a higher power. For somebody yes. else, it's the universe. For somebody else, it's just life. Life yes. works out, or it's nature. Yes. You see that nature always has these cycles and, and always works itself out. Maybe it's that. But some faith in something, and you go, I'm going to take this concern, this fear I have, and I'm just going to lay it on this, whatever this, whatever you have faith in, yes. and I'm going to trust that it's going to work out. And yes, that's, exactly. that's where the positive affirmation comes into play. Yes, if things okay. are going to work out. And then these people can keep criticizing you and you're like, I know this thing's going to work out. So you can yes. keep telling me you think I look like a crack whore. I, it doesn't matter because <laughs> I'm not concerned with your problems. And exactly. Because I know I'm just going to hold on to this faith. And as we get older, we see we've had we have so many examples in our life to point to and say, I remember that one time when I was 16 and I was concerned about X, Y, Z, and that worked out. Or when I was 20, or when I was 30. You know what I mean? So as we get older, hopefully we're looking at more and more things that worked out, even exactly. terrible, tragic things that we got on the other side of. Yeah. We should be able to point to that and say, then, therefore, this current situation is going to work out somehow. It's going to be okay. Absolutely. And what you're describing in a word really is optimism in the end. Mm -hmm. That uh, it can be faith, it can be anything, but in the end, it's that feeling that things will be okay, things will get better. And it's really adopting that mindset because the opposite, the pessimism, I can't, I won't, it never will happen, all of those things really drag us to the ground. Oh, my God. And I, I, I'm going to, okay, let's look at some questions because I do think that, um, uh, I do think that you're going to get a basket of opportunities coming your way just because you were born. Yes. And if you say, like, oh, I can't this, I can't that, I can't yes. this then you're, you're Xing yourself out of these opportunities or being able to see these opportunities. Okay, Absolutely. so let me see some of these questions. Okay, uh, so what are the questions? I'll be for you. Uh, wait, this one's sort of... Uh, I can't even see any of them. Okay, ahead. hold on. I think this one's kind of interesting. Okay, oh, so this is from uh, Lenny Leanne Phillips. I hope I'm saying your first name right. Lenny? Um, okay, so... This is speaking about criticism. Can you talk about the way some people feel it's okay to express opinions about other people's physical appearances? What's up with that? And any tips on responding to that kind of uninvited criticism of experience of it, of appearance? Okay. Why do people feel like they can just like just bash you to pieces? <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I mean, that's it. That's an, it's interesting. You can't, I mean, maybe it'll change. I don't know. But, you know, like it used to be, you know, more commonplace to criticize people for being uh, overweight. Yep. And now yep. you can't do that. That's fat shame. Exactly. <laughs> yep. But I tend to go the other way. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care. People can still be critical about my face. Go for it. I mean, I, I, found, I found, you know, some more recently – that I copied and pasted into um, one of the stories. I'm trying to get the name of this story. It's about a, a woman who goes back to her high school reunion and mm. overhears some people criticizing her face. And so, uh, okay, so it's called Donna, 48 Actress. I won't read it, but um, 
the quotes of like the criticisms that she hears from this group of guys and then this the criticism she hears from this group of women i just copied and pasted what people were saying about me on on the message boards one seemed to be from a group of women because it was like mommy focused and oh yeah. it was from a group of guys because it was kind of sports focused so i say like go for it man because you're just telling me about you yeah that's it you're telling me about you so I, ha I don't happen to be in the camp of telling people to stop doing that because let it all hang out. You're just yeah. telling us that you're like a kind of a awful kind of person. So exactly. keep telling exactly. us that. That's fine. Exactly. Exactly. And who would who would want to do that? I mean, you just exactly telling you about the kind of person it is. It's a person who just is angry, is unhappy, wants to hurt somebody else they don't even know um and just get that anger out um and how dare a woman not you know look and act like my idea of how a woman should look at that well yeah well i mean you could that could be like how she dresses how she exactly. in that chair all of that and it's like okay you sound like you've had some buttons pushed sounds like you should go to therapy and talk about it because i'm going to say it however i like okay here's a question for you okay. Dr. Kirchhoff, can you share a few techniques or thoughts that you offer to your clients to help dispel the fear of aging or a negative body image? Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of techniques. I think one is to make peace with yourself. And so as people get older, there, there are different wrinkles, sags, whatever. And some people are very bothered by them, some less so. Some people get critical comments. Some have more criticism within themselves. For those who have self-critical ideas, I always suggest looking in the mirror. And often people will go right for, oh, look at that, oh, I look so tired. Oh, I look older than I thought. Oh, you know, my hair came out funny today. And I'll say, okay, those are your first thoughts. Please look and tell me several things that you like about the way you look. And sometimes people can't do it. And I'll say, I'm sure there's something. What kind of coming up in them when they feel like they can't do it yeah uh that they can't yeah they can't they say well i don't like the way i look i just you know maybe my clothes i'm like no no, no. let's that's fine that's fine but let's think of your eyes or mm. you know your shoulders or your hair or your lip anything Ear yeah your earlobes there's got to be something and people get there they do get there um and i will repeat that exercise with people too and it's really a mind shift. And a lot of people think as soon as they look in the mirror, what do I have to fix? Oh, I'm looking in the mirror in the morning. My hair's funny. This is wrong. That's wrong. And another way to look at it is just to say, what do I like? What are my strengths? What do I like about my parents? Oh, I have the same eyes as my mom. Or, you know, whatever kind of you know, positive emotional feelings you have can help to turn that around. Nancy, do you think they're trying to intercept their worst critics? Yes. Like, let me let me judge myself before you can judge me. So then if I if, if I think you're going to judge me because my hair is in front of my shirt, then I'm going to do this. So then when I'm in front of you, you can't yes. say that I have eliminated that opportunity. But the yes. trouble is those people then will go, oh, now that you've took you taken your hair off your shirt, I don't like your necklace at all. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Yeah, there's no end to it. There's, there's no win. Yeah, I know. So I, I was once part of a large survey that was done in 13 different countries with women from like 20s to 60s. And, you know, people were asked, um, you know, what uh, what are you most satisfied in life and what are you least? And uh, so their looks were way down at the bottom. The only thing that was lower was their income. So it was a whole group of women across the spectrum saying, well, I'm really unhappy with my income and I'm only a little less unhappy with my looks. But, you know, the things at the top were my friends, and, you know, uh, my, my family and you know, my accomplishments. But they were least satisfied with their own looks. And so I think women have really internalized that that feeling that they have to constantly be criticizing themselves. But as you say, it comes from the inner conflicts. Yeah. Um, okay, let me, uh, I think we have time for another one. Um, uh, I think there are eight questions. Uh, wait, I'll answer this one real quick, uh, real quick from Erica. It says, uh, do you ever feel that if you want, if you did want to do something to your face, do you feel like writing this book would then open <laughs> to unfair criticism? 
Yeah, I've really locked myself in now, Eric. I can never do anything in my face. I can never because I wrote this book. I mean, I, you and all the rest of the people in here would 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 be, you know, I, I truly would be attacked. Because it's like, oh, she's such a hypocrite. No, and I also like I it's a commitment to by in a way you made a commitment. I made a commitment. And I also feel like I would be it would be such a hostile gesture towards me, my me. Like yes. this place has been with me my whole life, has been in every situation with me, you know, just frustrating times and good times, and you know, I've laughed through it, I've cried through it, and all this. And I feel like it'd be so mean if I just said, Oh, well, now I don't like you, I'm just gonna cut you off and <laughs> Exactly. I feel the same. Oh, you know, one thing I'll tell people like, if you look in the mirror and you think you look older, go look at a picture that you took if you felt this way 10 years ago, five years ago. Yeah. Like, yes. so now, look at that picture now. You're going to look at it, you're going to go, What was I? What was yes, I? Exactly. I looked fine. I was like criticizing myself. Now picture yourself 10 years from now looking at a photo of you today. Yes. You're going to say the same thing. You're going to yeah. go, Why did I spend all that time criticizing myself? Because I'll tell you what I did. i tell you what I did, Nancy. This, I, I had to look at a bunch of photos recently because of, uh, anyway, to pick a photo for a publication to use. So I was looking through Getty Images, and there's me from like 16 all yeah. through my life, right? It's a whole photo album of like, you know, many, many, many years of my life. And I, and I know the age where I got that criticism that sent me down a rabbit hole. And I, as I was looking at all these pictures from 16 on, so like 16, I had a really round face. Yeah. And, and then, you know, I got like 19, 20, 21, it became, you know, it became more like, I'm just looking at myself in the, it became more like what it is now. Okay. Yeah. And then when I looked at like 40, 40, when I got this, uh, uh, this criticism, 40, 41, as I'm looking at all these photos, like all of them in a row, in a row, I went, oh my God, I barely look any different. I mean, I'm old, yeah, exactly. really, and when that, but when that attack happened, I was so convinced that they were right and I was wrong because there were so many of them and just one of me that I just did a number on my head and told myself I looked terrible. Mm -hmm. It was such a bad thing for me to do to myself. Yeah, and, and I I think that sometimes happens to um, right. people. Um, it listen, does. It does. Wait, you listen, feel this attacked. You feel attacked. And even I though you see I don't want to feel like that again, so so maybe I should go with what they're saying, and then maybe I should change it so that I never get attacked like that again. The truth is, just go. You're gonna get attacked. You're gonna get attacked. Exactly. Well, that's so it. I think, your love. I think particularly for women. I think particularly for successful women in all fields, yeah. they're you know you're open to attack, and oh, you might but be great. Maybe it's because yes, maybe it's because we're receptive to attacks. Yeah, I think we because. Are. Check out, what do you think of this? Here's my evolutionary theory. So I need a professor to tell me whether or not this is <laughs> exact. Um, I believe that women are have a better, in, can read a room much faster than a man and mm -hmm. can read body language and facial expressions and the tone and what people are saying because yes. that is how many women through, throughout history have survived. Yes. Because if the shit hit the fan and you need to get out of that room fast, you know who you think you can count on as an ally to get you out. Whereas if you're a man, gen this is all very generally speaking, generally speaking, you're more, you're physically stronger or as strong or physically stronger than the other people in the room. Yes. So if the shit hit the fan, you'd be able to get yourself out. You don't have yes. to look around for allies or ways out of the room or anything. You can just, maybe you can just bang through the wall. I don't know. Yes. So, because of that, I feel like women then are more acutely attuned to criticism yes. because they're like, oh, no, this is going to put me in a situation where I'm not going to be able to have allies if, if the shit hit the fan and I need yeah. to get out of the room. What do you think about that theory? Yeah, no, I think it's true. I think it's true. Women um, much more want to go into coalitions together. Um, they want to find backup from men or from women. There's more vulnerability to women, yeah. um, and in terms of size and strength, and often having children, especially ancestral history, very young, that they had to protect them as well. And so yeah. they were always more vulnerable, and always looking for who's going to have my back. Um, 
where men can just forge ahead and say, I'm getting out of here. I can protect myself. I don't need you. Um, but I think women always feel much safer in coalitions. Um, so knowing that, though, should yep. free us to go like, OK, this is I am currently not in a situation where if something went wrong, I couldn't get out. And so if somebody criticizes me, uh, I don't have to be, I don't have to accommodate that criticism because I don't need them as an ally to get out of this room. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, let's yeah. take one last. I'm curious if you've had the same experience of, uh, of the stigma surrounding menopause and women, uh, women's experience of it from, from Lori. Um, I myself, like, I think menopause is fucking great. Like, I can just have sex and not worry about like getting pregnant or anything like that. I, I think it's great. I mean, I know my, I know other women have like um, a different, different sort of um, uh, outcome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and there's changes in like my hair and uh, you know skin elasticity or you know all that kind of thing. So sure, but I mean. I wish we'd look at it more like, okay, I don't have to do that. I know. Anything to do, any concerns or responsibilities or whatever with procreation anymore. I can just yes. like exactly. go out and like have a good time. Exactly. That's how I see it. I think it's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a point at which, you know, it's nice to be free of it. It's nice to have moved on. Um, it's nice not to have periods all the time. And, yeah. um, they do <laughs> I, I think it's great. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I think I think it should happen earlier. You know, I mean, you should. You yeah, should I, to, I guess you can with a hysterectomy, but you should be able to opt into it after you're like, yeah, I think I've had my last kid. Can I just get into the? Uh, I, I can have sex like a guy now. Sooner. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I think you are very good at taking the optimistic position because it's true. I mean, we often look at everything as a loss, you know, and, and it, it isn't. It's the next phase of life, which has its benefits, as you just said. Have sex with who you want. No, it, it comes down to this. Like, the, I, for me, I feel like one of the some situations I have a choice in them, you know, and, and that's some kind of control I have over a situation, some kind of say in it. But a lot of times I don't. And yeah. the yeah. only thing I really do have complete control over in any situation, whether I had a choice or not, is the way I'm looking at the situation. Yes, yes. yes. So if I can change the way I'm looking at the situation and, and clear out anything that comes up as a result of that, like we've been talking, like it's, yeah. it's not about just like, oh, like Pollyanna, you know, just like have positive affirmations, your life will be great. I find most of the people that practice positive affirmations all the time are the people that have the most junk under the rug. Exactly. That yeah. it's big in there and it's hard work and it's messy and it's yeah. uncomfortable and it's emotional and upsetting. But man, on the other side of that, it's like having an infection. And if you just keep putting a bandaid over it, but if you go in there and do the hard work of scraping out that infection, it's yeah. going to be painful, then it'll heal. Yeah. And You'll forget about it. You won't have that issue. Won't be festering underneath. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, that was the original, in a way, the original Freudian idea was is all these things going on in your head that you don't know about it. It's like you're pushing them down into the basement, you know, where you can't verbalize them. And then, you know, the idea being you just set them free. You, you look at them, you understand them, you, you deal with it, and you move on. Um, but for so many people, they just don't, you know, they just have a yeah. hard time. I think a good perspective to have on the things that you dig up is just to be fascinated with it. Like exactly. I've had so many things come up with me where I'm like, oh my God, that is absolutely how I was thinking. Yep. And it's, I think if you have, if you have the perspective of, of being fascinated by it rather than embarrassed by it. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly. going to be in better shape. You know, if you just yeah. go, isn't that interesting? Look at that <laughs> thing that's been, that fear that's been living in me for so long. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think we all have them. And, uh, yeah. Well. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, this has been fascinating as always. Always <laughs> a real joy to talk with you. Yeah, thank you. thank you, Nancy. Really great.
We could go on for hours and hours. Yeah, we could. Well, hopefully we'll have a chance again somewhere sometime. Yeah. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to come visit you. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Thank yeah, you so, too, too. so much for, for coming. Um, that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you to all of our guests and to everyone who tuned yeah. in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just yes, I highly recommend you do. <laughs> Thank you. Just click the green purchase button that reads face directly below the viewer screen. If you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for taking the yeah. time to come and uh, also buy Survival of the Prettiest. It's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. We should get Amazon to bundle them. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Oh, your bookstore to bundle them. How about this bookstore to bundle? <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Thank you.